I think we'll we'll do this again at some point. You know, once you've no, we won't come down off this no, high. No, we won't. No, we won't. You've come down off the no, high of being not. this close to me. <laughs> I bought the uh, Sennheiser Profile. Ah. And it sounds really good to, uh, as on everything. Else. So we are recording now. So okay, great. You know, whether this intro, I mean, no, I'm, this is our intro. We're this we're is our intro. I mean, you know, I, I thought about it this morning. I was like, I've been trying to get Andrew. Uh, I've been trying to get you on my channel for thirty years. Yeah, of course you only told me last week, <laughs> but if you'd mentioned it earlier, I would have been on. I mean, the fact that we've known each other since. AOL was like the desired choice of going on the internet is pretty Dude, cool. I think it was actually pre AOL. I think it was like CompuServe yes. if you were enough of a geek to yeah. want to be on the internet. And then when we got AOL during that session, we were all like Oh yeah. Like Yeah, you know. badass. Yeah. <laughs> uh you know, that that's that session. I always call it Sherman just to to F with people so that, you know. They don't know what we're talking about. Remember that that code word? Yeah, sure? yeah. Um, so yeah, I like you, that. Word. <laughs> where are you? You're in LA, right? No, 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 no. I'm in the UK. Oh, I'm in the really? middle of uh, the middle of Worcestershire, which is in the middle of the country. Nobody knows where it is. And I thought that I was doing. I thought I was getting you up at nine o'clock in the morning to do this. No, 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 no. So it's later afternoon. Have you done had a session already today? Uh, well, I mean. I work at home and I'm basically just mixing. So yeah, I, I did some work. Okay. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't have sessions anymore. Like it never happens. I had one yesterday. Like an actual session. A vocal session. Uh, wow. And production, you know, cause I do a lot. I do mostly the combination of production and mixing now. And occasionally against you know, I'm not dying to have someone come over, like come and do a vocal, but unless they're good and it, it's like, you know. Not yeah, painful. I mean, it's the kind of thing you dread and then most of the time it's really fun. It's fun. It's a total yeah. dopamine hit or whatever the hell it is. Uh, and when when someone like this artist, she's brand new, like really brand new. And um, when someone like actually takes direction and and is in the the moment is it's like i mean you pinch yourself you're like wait a minute we just did we just got all the vocals we needed to get done today in an hour and a half and you know yeah. we've been there where it's like seven hours and you got nothing so yeah. i was like hey you know i don't know if you i don't even want to tell her sometimes like you know how smoothly it's going i'm just kind of like hey you know well fortunately she probably doesn't watch your your channel because she, she would know <laughs> <laughs> have you seen any of my uh, train wreck i have of okay. course I, I do research okay, I'm, okay you know i come prepared my my channel is um an extension of just taking a break at the studio the way i look yeah. at it you know what i mean like i just talk some stupid shit uh pontificate a little bit and um have fun with it i'm, I'm not really into the the super produced version. no no and i'm i'm hoping that's pretty much what we're doing today yeah, that's what we're doing i mean you know it, it's i think i think there's like i always used to look forward to the hang with my assistant or whatever you know like hey i'm burnt out like so like what are you trying to learn it you know lately you know yeah. that kind of thing and it, it's I think it's kind of bizarre because of our history, which I don't know how we could even like translate. I'm glad that. that we've just like jumped in. No one's introduced anybody. We're not going to explain anything. They know who you are. They know the thing. That they know who you are. You're you're a big deal. Uh, well, <laughs> I don't know about that, but Andrew Sheps. Well, like like I can't even tell you how many times I've told people like they your name has come up. I'm like, yeah, I know Andrew. Like, you know Andrew Sheps. Uh, you know you know andrew chefs yes i'm like yeah yeah i know i know when whenever i hear anybody say jesus i think no 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 call me tony uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> which was your line all the way through the session you never missed one i never missed one no, please call no. me tony 
uh, and I do think, and I've thought this a lot, that your monarch, your little motto, don't be a dick, has something to do with me. Well, no, because you actually do have a career. So oh, okay. it, couldn't, it couldn't be to do with you. No, you were great to have in the room. You're a sarcastic fuck, yeah, but we're, you're we're, great to have in the room. Yeah. It was super fun. And whenever w the thing was, when there was stuff to do, yeah. you did it. I mean, there was no question yeah. about that. Yeah. I, I, I talk about that, um, you know, for those that don't know, we're sort of talking about a mythical Michael Jackson session that went for about a year or off and on like a year extended yeah i mean i was 18 months because i took it back to la when we went yeah but i was yeah. i was about a le eight nine months and then another couple of months when he came back for the show yeah which was like that was like coming back for season two i got a story about that which okay. i better tell you now because we're going to forget okay. so when we came back for the show and we're doing all the pre-record stuff onto i think it was onto d88s or something like that now we had Pro Tools at that point. We did, but I thought that we were transferring everything to D88s to take it to the stage, whatever it was. I was going back and forth to the yes. rehearsals. To SIR. So, yeah. and I'm going to have to do a little Googling because I'm going to forget his name now, which is going to suck. Do you remember that Jennifer Batten couldn't do that show and that yeah. they had this super, they, she wasn't doing the show and they had this super young guitar prodigy, this Australian guy who's great really great guitar player yeah. um we're gonna ha you're gonna have to google I and don't... fill in the name because my yeah. brain is not going because so i went to australia in 2019 so just before lockdown i was there like november or something like that okay and i'm on a boat randomly which because for me that's sort of a weird thing and on the boat are a couple of people and one of them is this guitar player <laughs> like what the fuck so 27 years later or whatever it was i'm on a boat with this guy and then i helped um i helped him finish his record he was you know recording and mixing and stuff he would just send me mixes i'd give him some comments send him back and it's great and i cannot believe that i can't pull his name out of my neurons but we'll we'll find it and you'll I mean, put the it show never happened did he ever do no. any no because it was just for that hbo special you know and I was in there when Michael collapsed, and like that was the last thing that ever happened because I was dropping off you tapes. You were there that day. Yeah, I, I mean, was I actually was, in the theater. Yeah. I was at uh, Studio Four, um, and you know what's cool is like the other day on my stream, my live stream stuff. I've been showing these young guys like these pictures of Studio Four and all that stuff. You know, that that was such a paradise of a place. I mean, it, it's yeah, like you can't describe that to anybody right the experience of studio one no i mean you know there are rooms like it but no i mean the days when we had all four studios booked <laughs> when we had slash in three bruce yeah. was always in four four uh yeah eddie was set up in yeah. three and then we had um the full orchestra going on in one yeah that's or crazy. or we were playing ping pong up there or i was mixing yeah. a friend's rock record up there or you know Shh. you know what i mean it's like i remember yeah. one day mixing my friend's demo up there and i looked out the glass and all of a sudden like michael was there with a friend playing ping pong and i called my friend and i was like you know, I'm mixing your demo right now, and Michael Jackson is out in the live room playing ping pong. And I hate to say it, but it's like it's on Sony's dime. Technically, his, I was like, I, you know, yeah, I can't well, make it up. No, don't don't tell Troy though. I actually saw Troy at AES this year. I, I gotta ago. I gotta visit him one of these days. I haven't seen him yeah. in a million years, but uh, Yeah, he's good, man. It's yeah. I, like you wouldn't believe it's as many years as it is. I mean, you know, we look like fresh young-faced babies, but yeah. uh yeah. <laughs> uh so the kid yeah, so the guitar player and that and that show, yeah. I mean I mean the Sherman thing just for anybody like we could say it now i mean it's like yeah the, the michael jackson session went under the code name sherman because mr sherman yeah. because we were trying to avoid and the studio was trying to avoid the media finding out and all that kind of stuff yeah and sense. they did really well i mean i don't remember yeah. us ever getting 
people showing up. I I think the only thing that happened was intentional. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, hey, we need some publicity. And MJ's side did some of that stuff. Yeah. I haven't, I saw Brad uh, Sunberg a few years ago. I went to one of his things here in the city. All right. And, uh, but I, I'm going to cut in a little bit. I'm going to just say, I wanted to okay. know. Yeah. Because I get asked this once in a while. Um, like, what did you learn from Bruce? Sweetie? <laughs> Um, it's weird. It's like osmosis, what you learn yeah. from Bruce. I felt the same way. He's, he's like Al Schmidt. It's so effortless that yeah. you like, that guy's not doing anything. And yeah. his stuff sounds so much better than anyone else. Yeah. Um, I mean, I learned studio practical jokes. He used to, of course, of course. he used to blow me out with the mains every time I had to go behind the console and then oh. laugh. I didn't yeah. know about that. Sure. Yeah, because the Synclavier was set up where the tower fort was behind the console and then the keyboard was on the credenza. And I'd have to go back there to change a disc or something. And uh, every time, bam, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> by the way, I did a little Bruce imitation on my live stream and guys were losing their minds. Oh, Tony. Yeah, <laughs> Andrew. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, he's so fun. He's so good. So yeah. unbelievably good. I mean, in his whole recording technique of recording everything in stereo and sometimes with coincident omnis and you think like, well, that's ridiculous. And what, mm -hmm. But it's amazing. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's just balance. You know, it's all about balance. I, if there's anything that I got, I, I had a couple little conversations with him when I could. I mean, I always felt that like, what you're saying, the less is more thing, keep it f simple as shit. Like, and it's about levels and pans yeah. and just getting stuff out of the way. And, and also, I mean, I gotta be honest, like the way I learned a lot, first of all, I learned a lot more on that session than I knew I was learning. You know what I mean? That came with me yeah. for us and especially from eddie delena and you and even rob and you know whoever yeah um, but like Brian. the way that the way that um the way bruce was the captain of the ship that suck stuck with me like that's the way you handle yourself when you're on a big project you know what i mean yeah. like you have to sort of manage the entire thing you can't really be the guy with the the court jester hat all that you know like you can fuck around but it's still got to be the artist has to be able to know that like you're the guy holding it together and i learned yeah. that from bruce a lot and eddie but uh, yeah yeah have you seen eddie i haven't seen him in a while i email him on his birthday i mean he okay. he became a sommelier yeah yeah, yeah. Like I mean, hardcore. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think when the last time I actually saw him was. It was a while ago. It was a while ago. I know. I got to say, there, there was one really funny thing with him, though. I mean, yeah. for people who don't know, just look, image search Eddie Delena. Yeah, yeah. And you'll smooth. see he is a good looking man. Yeah, 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 smooth guy. I mean, our, our mic check was Eddie's hair is like butter, which is a song that I made up. But we went to his wedding with yeah. Lisa. Yeah. And most of the women that were wearing black. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's just all you need to know. Um, yeah. Great guy. I mean, I learned so much from Eddie. Yeah. Amazing. It, it, yeah. I, I think the combination of, and I've talked about this on air, off air, whatever. I was like, everybody in the room eventually went on to something pretty, pretty big. Um, yeah. And, and pretty substantial. And, it it kind of like reflected upon like how much brain power was going on in the room like all the time there was always yeah there was no like there wasn't anybody really i mean i was like the newest guy in the thing well me and rob were like the newest dudes to the whole yeah. thing but uh it, it there's something to that a team thing like when people talk about like why did this happen what did that happen? i'm like have you looked at the credits on like some of these albums like you know yeah but there was definitely i mean all the way through the record like whatever needed to happen we just did it like when we were yeah. mixing earth song yeah in la it was four thirty-three forty-eights full of stuff 
which was ridiculous, mm -hmm. but that's how much stuff it was. And we had to tie two control rooms together to do it. But the the point is we had to lock up four 3348s yeah. and we'd only ever done two. Yeah. And yeah. I had an idea like, well, I bet if you do this, it'll work. But I called Sony yeah. and like, hey, so we need to do this thing. I think I'm going to do it like this, but is that going to work? And like, well, the guy who knows he's at lunch. Mm. Like, okay. So I just went ahead and did it and it was working great. And they called back and said, oh, no, you can't do that. I'm like, well, you might want to come over because <laughs> wow. we're already doing it. And that's the way that entire session was. Whatever had to happen, happened. And it didn't even yeah. occur to us that it was crazy. And it and there was no, the word no was not really like in the vocabulary. No, exactly. I mean, and obviously having basically an unlimited budget made that stuff able to happen. But yeah, we pulled off a lot of stuff yeah uh and also you know it was it was um we were probably underused in a lot of ways because i mean like guys like that all sitting around waiting for something to happen was part of the survival <laughs> of the whole th like surviving yeah. that mentality was a big learning the hurry up and wait right that used to be the, the yeah uh, the mantra but it's 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 something that's like was so surreal because of the um the boot camp version the thing of like you know go behind the doors and no one else is there and you're in this like world and i think everybody did a really good job of getting along under yeah. really like not easy to do by the time you know you're of course you get sick of this one's joke or that one's thing or me being a crab or what you know the brat thing or whatever but like it no, all worked because there's a great group of people, but everybody's know. personality was different. Yeah, which was very interesting. Like there weren't, there weren't two peas in a pod anywhere. It was like, yeah, all characters, you know. But yeah, Eddie Delena is a big influence on my career. Like the way I handled myself going forward when I was in the chair, you know, like like hey, yeah. I've seen how it, that was the other thing cool about Bruce, like, and Eddie was like, you never saw them outwardly, like, lose their cool with somebody. It was. No, 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 no. And, you know, going back a little ways on engineers, they have a, they had a tendency to be bullies and abusive and all that. And here we had two of the nicest guys going yeah. on the etiquette thing, you know? Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, it's weird. And then when sometimes you're in a session and the producer is given like the assistant a really hard time, yeah. but they're being really nice to you. Yeah. And then when you ask them like, oh, well, that's how, you know, I was treated coming up. Like, well, OK, yeah. but that's the excuse for child abuse. I mean, yeah. like, it's yeah. that's, crazy. So I've had conversations with pretty close friends about that where I was like sort of like visiting them on a session and then saw them go off on an assistant. And I'm like, you know, what was that all about? Uh, that's how I learned. I was like, like, no, it's not. It's how you got <laughs> scarred. Yeah. I'm like, dude, that's not cool. Like, that no. is just, that's not okay. First of all, we're making records. It's not like they dropped a candy bar into an open wound, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, give me a break. He uh, missed the patch. You know, we've all done it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Guilty. guilty. I'm t there's two things I'm really not into, like... Me and what else? Yeah, you. I mean, you know, the, and the thing. Not only did you invent the don't be a dick, but did you invent, you called yourself the audio janitor from like the word go. Yeah, I mean, I certainly didn't invent don't I be a dick. I think you invented dick, it. But, okay, all right. I'll take that because it's a good thing. Yeah, yeah, I was the audio janitor. That was my self-proclaimed role on that session. I mean, I've taken credit for inventing the vocal comp. So like you know, have you? Yeah, I, nice. I invented it. You know, one day cool. I was like working and we had a bunch of vocal takes, and I was like, you know what I can do is combine these to another track, all on one track. And God, that's amazing! It, it made its way around the whole entire industry. Yeah, I mean, and it it time traveled too, which is that's how good it was. Yeah, you don't know how many assistants and artists I've told that, and they're like, really. Look, we used to send people over to Sony to get fresh reverb. Yeah. I mean, you know, empty the empty the echo tanks. Uh, yeah, 
There was a bunch of them. Um, let me look at my yellow paper here. Audio janitor. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you had that on there. I'd kind of forgotten about that. I yeah. feel like I might have graduated a little bit from no. audio janitor. Yeah, you have. You have. You have. Um, I mean, have you talked about the sync levier with anybody? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I didn't even understand what the sync levier was even like during that session. Like, and I never really saw you. I was never in the room when you were messing with that thing. So like, to me, it's, it was just sort of like this mythical thing. It was just yeah. a gigantic MPC 60 with more buttons and a disc recorder and an FM synth. Like it was just, it was a DAW. It was the first, not the first, cause there were a few of them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was just the first, one of the first generation of digital audio workstation. It didn't you have a, a timeline though, did it? Like, like a, you know. Not that you could see okay. in that way. No, yeah. no. You you placed audio into the sequencer, basically. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Really? Was, and how many tracks could you do? Uh, at that point, you could do sixteen tracks, but it was just input to output. You know, there's no mixing. There's no nothing. You could edit clips and then put them into the sequencer, or you could just play back from the tracks. Right. So. We could detour really quickly. I want to ask you about this because I brought this up on my channel and it became like a thing. Remember the the M remember the the drift test that we did with the MPCs and all that stuff? Like, oh yeah. Maybe I I hope I explained it to people like the way that I understood it, and I tested it even later on at my studio because I had a two thousand. But like, can you explain it like? quickly like what was going on with the drift and why maybe the mpc had a little bit of a a feel well, of like to me of a drummer because like it yeah i mean if you want to go super geeky yeah yeah or... yeah because yeah, the, the mpc people freak over this stuff well as far as i know here's what i mean yeah. i don't i haven't talked to anybody at akai i don't know what yeah. the hell is going on but like we were using 3348s. Mm -hmm. So we immediately got a crash course in synchronization. And so you've got your time code clock and then you've got your uh, digital word clock, which we used video yeah. to control. So you've got position and you've got speed yeah. and they're separate. Yeah. Position says, I'm going to start from here. And then the speed thing says, how fast do you want to play? You don't just start and let the machine do whatever it wants to do. Right. Because they swim around. Right. Right. Because they've got it's called a phase lock loop, right? right? So it gets a little ahead of itself, then a little behind and whatever. And it's constantly just staying there. Yep. And I think when you're feeding time code into any sequencer, they don't take a speed reference. Right? You just give them time code, you got a tempo, it starts playing. So the first thing is that the tempo isn't exactly the same on every single thing. Because there's some internal clock and they do some math. And right. that's and right. so there's rounding at everything but like one frequency or one uh, tempo and i don't know what tempo that yeah. is but we so found, there's do you remember we found that like the rollins were like really tight yeah and that the akai had this like yeah so i i think it's just got to be how tight the phase lock loop is and i don't think it was like akai saying oh we don't care if this thing locks no. up i think they felt like it could pull too fast or something if it was too tight. So they would let it swim a little bit. Oh, do you think that? Okay. I'm assuming, I mean, it has to be a design decision and it's not like phase lock loops hadn't, I mean, that's every analog tape machine in the world. Mm. That's how they work. So yeah. the technology had been around forever. It was a digital version of it, but um, yeah, that's what I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, uh, you know. it's funny. Cause like a lot of people think that like, that the MPCs, everything has to do with the swing for function. But I don't think it's that. I think it's the fact that that thing actually has like a slight, even when it's not locked to time code. Yeah. I think it has a slight little like thing that like a drummer has that's like a little drift. Whereas like other people have said, you know, the SP1200 feels tighter. I don't know if anybody could feel those things. Yeah, I mean, because you know? look, it's two things. One would be the sequencer running, saying, I am at this tempo. And right. like, how accurate is it? Does it slow right. down and catch up? Like, what happens there? But it's also the triggering of the samples. 
Yeah. Like that was a big deal with the Synclavier. It was sample accurate when you sequenced. So if you wanted, like if track one of the sequencer was the kick yeah. and you wanted the kick louder, you would duplicate the MIDI track. Right. And it would be 6 dB louder because it was triggering the sample sample accurately twice. Oh, really? Like crazy. That but nothing else was that, you know, yeah. like that's that's why they cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. But with the drum machines, I mean, how accurate is their sample triggering? Because it's definitely not sample accurate. Yes. Yes. So, I mean, I think, you know, if you wanted to be a total geek, you'd sample the click, yeah. sequence it and print it like 40 times, line them up, see if it's drift. Like, who knows? But Well, I but did the uh, bit in my studio at some point where I like um, recorded the tempo track of the MPC into my computer, into Pro Tools and looked at it. And it was like, man, that damn thing, when it's 95 beats, beats per minute, 95.000, it's almost never 95.000. It's like- Yeah, it's and, swimming around. And also depending maybe on how much how many things were happening MIDI wise and, and yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so when it's buffering the samples out, can it trigger more than one at the same time? Or does it have to get like the eight sample buffer clear for the? I mean, yeah, I don't yeah. have any idea. It's a, uh, there's a, you know, the MPC lifestyle is, is still a huge thing out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. And all of them. I mean, I, the very first studio gig I ever had was I was interning at planet studios, which was on 33rd. I think it was just South of Penn station and it was in the basement of some building. Okay. And it was awesome because they had one studio with an MCI console and then they had two rehearsal rooms. So like at one point the Ramones were rehearsing, right? Wow. It was badass, but in the studio, um, Dougie Fresh was in there, and I don't remember the name of the producer, but the way they did their beats was they had a Lindrum, and they would program them like rock beats, okay. and then there was a grease pencil mark on the swing slider, and they would go boop, and then go track it. Really? Like, yeah. And that was the feel, was this one spot on the swing slider, but they didn't even program them with that because it was easier to play the stuff in yeah, 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 when it was yeah, straight. Yeah. And then they'd swing it. And, you know, I'm not going to yeah, say that everything they ever did, but that was right. what they were doing then. Because that stuff did have a little bit of that skippity, skippity hop kind of feel. Yeah. Um, yeah. They yeah. also blew up the Yuris a lot with their turntables. The Yuris <laughs> were an ugly thing. Yeah, you know, yeah. Anything where a light bulb is your speaker yeah. fuse. You know, the the Michael session was kind of like the birth of the subwoofer in the in the big studios too, because of the, that whole gigantic yeah. wall thing that was put in. I mean, prior to that, the Hit Factory had no subwoofers anywhere. No, no. And you know, when they had the Yuris with no sub, and like the only way to get bottom was to just turn it all the way up and. Yeah. I mean, I would see those Christmas lights going. Well, do you remember how excited Bruce was when he set those tannoys on fire? They yeah. lent us some big tannoys to listen to, and he set one of the tweeters on fire. Yeah. And he was like, "That I'm the best. <laughs> <laughs> there were some violent sounds coming out of that room. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I've talked to some friends of mine about it. I was like, you know, about the MPC. I was like, I don't know if I could describe to you how much... I heard that click coming out of these just enormously loud speakers yeah. uh, for, on end, like tick, yeah. tick, tick, tick with Brad. And with those huge just banks of clacks and wood smacks. I mean, I remember we went up to the third floor, which was like the only undeveloped floor of the yeah. studio yeah. and sampled every piece of wood we could find. Yeah. Some yeah. of this stuff obviously was so out. Um, you know, and so far from the Quincy making records kind of thing, that yeah. that part that part was somewhat frustrating, especially on a you know I can't I'm, I was more into like music than I was into engineering, so like right. I was I was like ah, you know we're gonna be like I'm gonna see some playing and some you know this and that and it and it was like is any of the science project ever gonna end with the never. 
you know, the minutia. But it's a really, I mean, I haven't listened to it in a while, but it's an interesting sounding record. It's not like other stuff that was going on. It's been a while. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all of his records were innovative. Let's be honest. I mean, yeah, it's not, it's not, uh, so. All right. What, 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 what's next on the pad? The pad says, uh, like, how do you keep looking forward? Like, that's, that's a challenge I'm into. Like, you know, how do you not go like into the, like the yelling at the clouds thing? And like, how do you, you mean the get off my lawn thing? Yeah, or? That too. Yeah. Yeah. The get off my lawn. Um, well, in what way? Like, what, what do you mean? Like, you know, are you, are you still pecking around at new stuff? I mean, I know you have your, your own app and all that with the, the, the bounce factory and everything, but like, yeah like how do you look at like new stuff and like where things are going and what i mean i hate to say it like you know what the kids are doing or whatever but you know there's a lot there i mean yeah there is and i ignore all of it okay to be honest i do i don't like i get the work i get it's one of the reasons that i'm really really happy i moved out of la because la you spend your entire life hearing about all the work you're not getting yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a disaster for someone like me. Yeah. I've got lots and lots of imposter syndrome and like it's a disaster to hear about okay. stuff I'm not doing. So now I get the work I get and every once in a while I'll chase something down but usually not and it's just sometimes stuff comes to me like wow, never heard anything like that before. But because I'm really just mixing now, mm. probably 90 something percent of the time I'm not worried about how it's getting created. So it's not like I don't care. I find it really interesting. Like the AI stuff that's going on in software right now is amazing, but I'm using the tools not for creating. I'm using it for like demixing. Made a record where all the vocals were tracked at the piano. So there's bleed all over both instruments. And I couldn't do what I needed to do. And I managed to separate it. And I have completely clean vocal, completely clean piano. And that, Two years ago, I couldn't have done that. Right. And that's, I don't understand how that actually works. Like, but I mean, it, it's one of those. You train things. software to like know what pianos are and what vocals are. And it doesn't always work. But when right. it works, it is absolutely like magic. And yeah. it completely saved a record. And it's one of the few things I still produce. So it was a big deal. Like it needed to happen or this record would not have been as good. So why was it recorded that way? Uh, because it's the way the guy who wrote the songs recorded himself, uh, you know. Okay. It's okay. just that's the way it happened. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that stuff is really interesting to me. But yeah, it's more. It seems to be more from a geek perspective that I get excited about stuff in a way. Um, are you still are you mixing in Pro Tools? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm really at a point where I despise the Apollo um and and that like that whole lifestyle with i can't under i don't understand the console thing that much and i i really feel as though like when i got rid of my hd setup because it wouldn't work anymore and all that that like i took i i made compromises with this new shit you know like with yeah. the latency because i i do a lot of recording of myself too like of, right and it's like what do you mean there's latency? Like, I didn't have latency in, in 2003. Right. Yeah, well, because it wasn't native-based yeah. processing, yeah. you know. Just, yeah. And there there are some good solutions, but they're expensive, you know. Yes. Yeah. Like, the DAD stuff is insane. 256 channels over Thunderbolt, and their mic pre's are incredible, and there's, yeah. I don't know, it's, it's like the delay through the box is microseconds. Okay. But you still have to go through the buffer on the machine. Yeah. So like, I still have my HDX cards and I run them in the native mode. But if I need to overdub something, I can have a zero latency throughput. Yeah. I just can't know. believe that like this is to some degree that, that it's acceptable that there is latency in well, 2024. I'll tell you what, just record something and have no plugins in your session and you're fine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> but yeah having to use a, a, a nev- another app just for monitoring and stuff i hate that i couldn't even believe what's what some people 
have told me that they would are willing to put up with like oh yeah we punch in on a track while the the other one yeah the track still keeps playing and and like i'm like how no. are we going back in time like like that's just not that's not punching yeah. in well here here's a solution for you yeah don't record yeah i love that solution i mean now right. I, don't, I, I love recording i'm listen i'm like you know, there's one thing, you know, during that MJ thing and during my, you know, that obviously that session created a complete monster and that like I came out of that and was like all of a sudden valid and like got it. Yeah, no, that's a big problem. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I came out, the dragon came out of the, the cave, you know, and and was like unleashed on the hip hop world. And so I started doing all that and I didn't play guitar for like five years. Like when these kids tell me like, Oh, you were in the right place at the right time. And you, you know, it, it's all different now, but like, you know, you didn't work that hard to get what you, you were, the gatekeepers picked you or some shit. I'm like, uh, we did a hundred hour weeks and I don't even know. I mean, and listen, relationships ended. Yeah. Fucking, yeah. I mean, your, the your entire body. time the entire time we were at hit factory except for there was one week sort of near thanksgiving where we took a week off yeah. one but we were there for two thanksgivings i think yeah i think i had seven days off yeah, it's like and that's including weekends like yeah. we had seven days off yeah there was no like i have a sniffle i'm not coming in it was like you're in no of course you got sick as soon as the session ended like you know for like a month you know, yeah it's like oh. yeah but uh yeah that it, the the grind is is hard to describe to people in that like you know it was different it's, it's different. just look it it's an amazing opportunity and yeah. it did well for all of us but it's all work it's all work yeah, yeah. it's you know if for someone in the business to say that to you is I don't want to be mean about it, but it's just ignorant. It's yeah. stupidity. Yeah. People outside of what we do think yeah. that it's not work and like, well, okay, fine. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we're not saving lives. We are just making music. We're not, you know, working physically all day necessarily, yeah. whatever, but it's really hard work and the hours suck. Most of the time the money sucks. Yeah. And most yeah. of the time, the thing that you think is the best thing in the entire universe barely even comes out. So, well, I mean, I've told, I think, less than half of the stuff i ever worked on came out yeah yeah so to have an opportunity like michael session is fantastic but yeah. at the same time yeah 100 hour week i mean that was nothing yeah that was like hey wow i mean uh i got i'm getting four hours of sleep tonight i'm i'm, I'm pretty excited yeah I, I mean i remember um with rob especially there were so many nights where if he had gone home he would have just turned right back around because he was living he, in, in the Jers. He was I think he Jersey. was in Jersey, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he's like, he just slept at the studio most of the time during the week. I know that my roommates never saw me except for like me leaving in the morning on the rollerblades to go down Central <laughs> Park West and to get to the studio. I forgot that you rollerbladed to work. That was uh, so insane. I would go yeah. home at four o'clock in the morning on rollerblades up Central Park West. Like, hello yeah you know mug me mug me now yeah. so yeah. one day it's... after that i almost got killed on broadway on the way to a session like i was sleep riding and uh a truck did like a went around me kind of thing and uh i got to the studio i was working with some famous guitar player guy and um i had always rode with uh wrist guards that was my safety yeah and i went to leave that night at like four o'clock three o'clock in the morning and i was like where's my wrist guards you know and like and i was really spooked all day like wow i almost died you know came really close to fucking getting wiped out and at three o'clock in the morning i was like i can't take it anymore i can't look for my wrist guards i'll find them i gotta go home so i ride home and i'm like man this feels really weird no wrist guards i get to my apartment i open the door and there they are on the table i was like i was i was asleep on the way to the studio like it's not good uh but you know that you know the feeling you're like yeah sleep yeah. deprivation was yeah real yeah i mean in la driving home in morning rush hour was like normal yeah, it's yeah just yeah. 
weird. Now, the, the other beard, like the Rick thing, like what what'd you get out of that? Well, let me just tell you that yeah. the very first gig I did, I'd gotten calls to do stuff on and off for a couple of years, but like schedule never happened. I mean, and not from him, you know, project coordinator, like, hey, one of your engineers recommended you, can you come and do this? Like, couldn't do it. So the first thing I ever did was on uh, Saul Williams' first record. Don't know that. They, um, he's, he's pretty cool. Okay. Look him up, All right. Saul Williams. And they had programmed everything on an MPC-60, Wow. And then they just dumped it stereo to tape and then did all the overdubs and the vocals and whatever. And they'd started mixing. And Rick wanted some of this stuff to be split up. And they hadn't even locked it to tape. They just like hit play. Flew it. Just so I was the guy. It. I came in and I built tempo maps and I locked up the MPC 60 and multi-tracked everything out of it. So that's the very first thing I ever did with Rick. What you built the tempo map with Pro Tools? I built, yeah, I built a tempo map with Pro Tools and had that spit MIDI to the MPC-60. So that Pro Tools yeah. was reading, it was probably Studio Vision, to be honest. It wasn't, probably wasn't Pro Tools really? at that point. Do you think yeah. you, could, you could you could tempo map with Studio Vision? I don't remember. Oh, God, yeah. It was the best tempo mapping in the whole world. You could record audio or MIDI and you could just drag the bars behind it and say, oh, nope, that's where the bar goes, and drop it, and tempo map done. Like, oh, no just Because I was a big Studio Vision guy, and then, you know, the audio to MIDI and all that crazy shit. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, so that's how you got started with Rick? So that's the very first thing I ever did with Rick, yeah. Audio janitor thing. That audio janitor. Cool. Audio janitor. But, you know, if you, you show up and make something happen, then, you know, yeah. you stick around. So, yeah, I worked with him for, like, 12 years. Something did you like really? That. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, not everything I did was with him, but right, yeah, right, right. Um, yeah. I mean, listen, he de he doesn't turn down a podcast. He hasn't done mine yet, but or just, but, but he doesn't. <laughs> no, do it's anything. weird. He never talked at all, and the last right. two years or so, yeah, he's talking to everybody. I mean, so listen, I don't need to tell you anything. I, I don't. I mean, watch the thing... I mean, like, I, it's like you know, him in the toe. I don't. I can't really handle too much of it's... the thing that definitely it was reinforced to me to the point where like I can never unlearn it is the other thing I always say, which is that the only thing that matters is what comes out of the speakers. I, I don't care how long you took, what piece of gear, like it absolutely doesn't matter. If when you listen to it, it's great. It's great. If it isn't, it isn't. Mm -hmm. Maybe you spent six weeks on it. Who cares? Now he can enforce that with unlimited budgets. Once again, yeah, yeah. you know, if it's not happening, you yeah. just keep working on it. So you don't have that luxury, but especially applying to mixing you do have that luxury yeah you know i don't know that many people who are like okay today i'm mixing this song and it has to be done by five to get comments so i can print it and move on to the next one tomorrow like when i still had my console that's how that worked yeah. and it that's 15 years ago now or yeah. something so that was re it's an obvious thing but to live it is different yeah yeah and I lived that for 12 years on those projects. And it really just made me stop worrying about stupid shit and just get on with trying to make stuff amazing. You know, now, did you ever feel as though the like some magic stuff though? Like you missed some because like there was there was so much of a like, you know, well, we don't have to yet kind of thing. Like No, 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 no. If something if some first take was great, you moved on. Oh, okay. It wasn't like, oh, let's see if we can beat it. That's it wasn't that ever. Okay. But if it took three weeks to get the take that was worth doing, yeah. Okay. That's big. I mean, I, I worked a fair amount with Steinman and he was more of like let's exhaust every idea kind of guy. But I've said it recently, like, you know, if he does one record that does 40 million copies, like how are you going to yeah. argue with that? I mean, that is real. That is, and that's not yeah, absolutely. easy to do. No, no, not at all. And there, there are a bunch of producers who work that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. People think it's maniacal. Oh, why does it take so long? And I'll say like, well, it just does. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, one of my favorite producers and engineers is Alan Mulder. And right. I haven't gotten to work with him, but I've talked to him a bit. Right. And he, you know, he wants to make sure that he's getting it right. Yeah. 
Yeah. I think from my from my digging around, I think we're running out of those guys. Don't you think there's like a bunch of things that were that are slowly like disappearing? I think that yeah, in a way, like you can't explore every possibility if you don't know what the possibilities are. Right. And I think that there's a lack of sort of fundamental wide knowledge that's yeah. like, hey, forget about the tools for a second, but this is physics yeah. in a room. Like this is the way microphones work. So that you understand that, oh, the pickup pattern actually affects the sound. And so if I'm trying to record a vocal right up close, and it sounds boomy, we'll switch it to Omni or, you know, like things that you don't necessarily know if you don't study it. But, you know, I'm not going to make the argument that everyone should go to school for it either. Mm. But I think it's going away because people's tool sets are, they're so powerful that they are limited. They don't need to know every piece of gear that's available because one thing can cover everything so you just know that one thing really really well i i mean i don't know how much i believe what i'm saying i'm kind of making it up on the fly but i think that there is i'm remembering this now i'm remembering yeah yeah I remember, you're, you're i remember you now you're thinking well, why the hell did i have him on <laughs> this is terrible this guy is there, there is something but you know whenever something goes away something else replaces it i mean you know the, the, some of the production that gets done now that you'd be like what and it mm -hmm. happens on the fly and people just taking stuff off their phones yeah. it's awesome yeah it's awesome so i don't know that it's to the detriment of music but yeah some of the stuff we grew up with is gone yeah i think for me personally the thing that i think that is a huge you know a thing that's like tragic is that the isolation of everyone as opposed to that like crew thing so like how we're doing this interview basically yeah i mean you know this is this is like this kind of thing yeah i mean it's way better when you're all like the idea for me to like kick my channel back on because i had tr tried it oh, like a while ago was during the pandemic, when we last talked, when I was in St. Louis, I would get together with a few of my friends, uh, new acquaintances, on uh, Friday mornings, and we would have these kind of wraps. Yeah. We called it the men of leisure. We would drink a gallon of coffee for like two hours, three hours, and we had like a 20-something-year-old guy, a 40-something-year-old guy, a 50-something, and a guy who was like 70. And he's, he'd probably know him. He's like part of AES. Um, um, and uh, so. You're not like, going to say his name, are you? Because you can't, you don't remember. No, I, I know his name. It's uh, Bill <laughs> Schellenberg. Um, he's from St. Louis. Bill. All right. But uh, I was just trying to maintain my focus in that. Like, I think, that <laughs> that's, I think that's a big problem is that like people aren't they are so isolated that they think like they're in just a loop of like yeah. what the, what their thoughts and, and then they go to YouTube and then they go to, yeah. you know, Reddit or something like that for like some info. And as opposed to like, when you're in the room with a bunch of people, even if it's a couple of times a month, you would, you would learn like some actual, thing practical much more practical stuff as opposed to like something that's being presented to you by like a guy on youtube who's going yeah. like and this is how i do it you know it's, and it's all rehearsed or you know it, it's never happening in real time let's be yeah. honest yeah so i think that there is a i've called it like a little bit of a, like a divide and conquer thing i think that tech is like dividing all the artists and the artist community by this isolation thing like you can do more and more without anybody you know yeah but how successful do you need to be to afford to be someplace with people you that, know that part is that part is real yeah yeah I and mean, it's and and also the fact that like you know the obviously the budgets and things like that aren't there yeah so like i remember working on the end of um Alicia Keys album, uh, you mentioned Maserati in your last thing because I saw a little bit of it. Him and I were mixing the same record at the same time, like literally the same record, in different rooms at Sony. Yeah. 
I popped in on the room on him, I think because I had recorded it. So I was like telling him like what was up. And I don't remember why we were both mixing it. But he said to me, he was like, I think this is going to be about one of the last times we see this. You know, and I was like, you mean like two guys getting paid like a lot in two really expensive studios? He's like, yeah. I was like, I think you're right, man. You know? Yeah. And it was kind of, 2004 was kind of like the the end of the shipping 600,000 copies the first week that go for yeah $11 or whatever the hell it would be, you know? Yeah, I think the isolation thing is the thing I bum out for, for like new guys, like to try and tell them, I'm like, man, I can't describe to you what it would be like to go into a major studio where you're learning from a technician, from a guy who like makes wires all day, from a guy who fixes microphones, and then all the other people, right? And sooner or later, it's all of a sudden, it's like just you in a room. Yeah. And that's the weirdest thing. I stayed in a hotel on the 17th floor where 237 Hit Factory used to be. Wow. And I went in a door that said 237 West 54th Street, but it was a Hilton. Wow. And I went in and I was like, the building used to be here. like, And it's all gone. Yeah. And I said to the doorman when I was leaving, I was like, do you know what uh, this used to be before, like, you know, they tore it all down and built this? He's like, no. I was like, and he was like a young uh, New York guy. I was like, the hit factory, like, Biggie's record, first record was made here. And he was just like, through this, he's like, this address? I was like, yeah. But really? like, none of it's here. Like, the ghosts, you could feel it, uh, the, the yeah. weirdness. But yeah, I, I mean, I lived in that building for about six weeks during the record. Did you really? Oh, in the yeah, Studio D or whatever it was? I lived there because I was so sick of the hotel. Like, the, yeah, you were sick of the New York Palace. Yeah. Unbelievable. And Debbie had already gone back to England. So okay. I just, yeah, so I moved into the studio for six weeks, I think. I, I sort of vaguely remember that. But yeah, that whole building is gone. That whole block. Wow. I think the triple was still there. Um, but it was like the, all the way to, to Broadway was, and I had to stay there cause I was going to like, I had a meeting the next morning. So I was like, you know, it's easier. This is when I was living in a, in Jersey and I was like, it's easier for me to just like get a hotel room, stay there and go to this thing the next morning. And when I booked it, I was like, is that the, is that the head factory? You know what I mean? Like, it was like really weird to walk on that yeah. block. That block. I'm sure. Uh, you know, and then obviously the 421 building being condos and all that shit is like. Yeah, I haven't gone past it. I haven't. I mean, it, I... it basically looks exactly the same on the outside. Right. It still says Hit Factory, too. Do they keep the lobby? I mean, it was I perfect so. for yeah. condos. Yeah. I mean, why wouldn't you? Yeah, I think they did. I just remember riding up in that freight elevator with lots of different people. Yeah. Man. <laughs> right, Carrie, one day. That yeah. was like. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, to people that don't know, this freight elevator was like big enough for a van to drive it because it used to be a parking deck. Yeah. And uh, they had lined it with like oak. But you could still drive in. There were certain people who parked indoors. Yes, downstairs and upstairs, yeah. I guess. But um, that elevator saw a whole lot. I mean, everybody, everybody's yeah. on that thing. I was, I was on that thing with Elton John, uh, Billy Joel on the way to go up and program drums with Elton during that HBO thing. Right. So that was bizarro. Crazy. So yeah, I came out of the that MJ thing and that you know, because I had taken on that crazy night scenario with Brad and like was hitting record and yeah, dealing. I've told that story a million times to people, but like when I came out of that, you know, Danielle was like I'm booking you everywhere. <laughs> You know, I was like, what? You know, <laughs> I was like, I don't even know where I've been the past 10 or 11 months, but like, okay. And then like that whole thing took off. It was like, what the fuck? Like, yeah, thank you. But, well done. Um, so, yeah, I was kind of like talking about what we were talking about with regards to like looking for, like, I'm, 
I do a little, not of a struggle, but like it's hard to relate to the hobbyist. I find. How, how do you do? You get a lot of that, like these people that are like, they're in it just for fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's which is great. Yeah. You know, I mean, there have always been people in it yeah. for fun, but on a hot, like a deep level, like you know, they own more stuff than. Yeah, but like, you know, audiophiles in the 70s with huge electrostatic speakers and their stereos on paper sounded better than anything we ever worked on in a studio and cost more. Yeah. You yeah. know. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, what's always weird to me are, it's just the questions. You know, you can yeah. tell who's like doing stuff and who's not based on the questions they ask. Yeah. You like, know. What, do you, what do you think is a dumb question? like well mixing in the box like what you know i hear that one all the time what, do you mix in the box or not mix in the box well my favorite version of that is that there are people who think that i still mix on my neve console but i say i mix in the box to sell plugins i think right. that's great like i would do that you are a shifty guy but i don't yeah. think you're fully capable of doing no no that's, i don't think i would want to do that it's more it's more like the more specific the question the more you realize it's not going to help if i answer it mm -hmm. you know like when you're you're showing somebody something like in a mix or in your template or whatever and they want to know the settings instead of like yeah okay but what what's the point yeah and it's getting from that, like, how do I set this thing to what does it do and how do I listen to right. it? That's a huge leap. Right. Yeah, there, there is that whole thing of, like, the, the thinking that, like, the setting is what it's all about. Uh, Believe me, man, I screenshot every Chad Blake video mm -hmm. and none of it ever works for me at all. And Chad thinks it's hilarious that I even bother. That's pretty funny. Um, yeah. I mean, listen, we all had, like, back in the day, we had access to all those recall sheets, and we'd all stare at them and go, like... Eh, yeah, but, you know, there's a there's a story of someone who actually did a record based on recalls trying to, like, okay, I'm going to do the Bruce thing, and it didn't work out. You know, it can't. Mm. The what Everybody hears differently, and it's, you know... Were they trying to mix something that he had mixed? No, recording. Recording. Oh, recording. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's, that's, you know, there's, yeah, that's no way that's going to make it, you know. No, but I mean, you don't know that, do you? And if you're insecure, whatever yeah. you think, like, oh man, what a great backup I've got to yeah. my gig is I've got, this is how Bruce would do it. Yeah. So when's and, the last time you did like a real like recording tracking thing? Um, Right before lockdown, okay. I produced a record for someone and it was great live band um all live takes and then a couple overdubs and that song would be done which was fantastic and actually i wasn't even engineering i was just producing it's one of the only records i've ever just produced wow. and phil brown was engineering who's a fucking legend yeah you know talk talk among yeah. other things um and that was incredible like that's my favorite thing in the world is a bunch of live musicians and you're working on the songs and then they get it and it's just like okay that didn't exist yeah six that's fun ago. that's fun that's great but yeah. it doesn't happen that often i just recorded um i i'm a total geek and we're not going to go down this rabbit hole because there won't even be time but i'm really into i love mixing in atmos so i do a lot of atmos music yeah, stuff yeah. Yeah. and so i've started recording i've got a 704 microphone array that I use and I just recorded a uh, string quartet on a couple of songs for a uh, low roar record. And we did it in a church in Paris and it's fucking unbelievable. It sounds so good. And even for the stereo version, okay, the options of just using the microphones that were miking the ceiling of the church for when they're playing harmonics and you bring the front mics in once they come back down and like just incredible really and that that stuff gets me excited i guess i love that it sure does that's yeah. unbelievable i mean i've never done any atmos stuff i've never even listened to it so i mean i think it's it, look it's one of those things where for me on the speakers in my room it is fucking life-changing listening cool. to music when it's a good mix like that it's incredible you're surrounded by the song uh -huh. in a good way now with a bad atmos mix it's like worse than a bad stereo mix really 
because you can't find the song like it's been ripped apart and there's stuff that's just distracting instead of being part of the song like it's much easier to destroy a song with more than two speakers but when it's good it's really amazing and then the whole consumer playback on headphones blah 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 let's not even talk about it but center is still center yeah yeah, yeah. you still have a front okay yeah okay there's definitely a front wall you know cool cool is there any like setup that you would recommend somebody getting that was like wanted like you know a budget friendly say like for mixing no for like listening even uh okay. for listening there are there are a bunch of sound bars that kind of have it built in where they've got lots of up firing tweeters and things so i don't remember sennheiser makes some sonos makes some if you can put together one where you've got a sound bar up front and then a couple satellite speakers you'll definitely get a really good sense of it. Okay. And what do people have to send you for you to do the Atmos mix? Well, it's, I like to get stems because the stereo mix is already done and mastered and whatever. So I just want a bunch of tracks that add up to that. Okay. So I'm not trying to recreate the Sonics because they're not supposed to change. Yeah. So there's no glory in I matched the mix. Like right. who gives a shit? Right. Right. So like when I'm doing at most of the stuff that I've mixed in stereo, I stem every single track. It's basically like a new multi-track, but those faders at zero basically is the mix. And then I can do anything I want using that raw material. Right. So and some people I, are like, oh, you're just panning stuff, but it's it's well beyond that. I mean, it's if you're going to do a terrible Atmos mix, yeah, it's yeah. just pan and stuff. But it's got to be more than that. I mean, there's definitely. It can't be that. It can't be that simple. I mean, you know. Yeah. It, but if you write down like, what are you doing? I'm panning. But it's all the musical decisions you make while you're tracking, recording, producing. Yeah. It's that. It's so. To clarify though, that like to some people that don't understand, and maybe even me, like when you say. When you say stems, you're not talking about like all the drums on stereo, right? You're talking about- No, I'm talking about like I print every single thing every through the stereo thing. box separately. See, so that, I that, can- That's a misunderstood thing. Yeah. To me, that stems. A lot of people yeah. refer to multi-tracks, which is the raw recordings right. as stems, and they're not stems. Right. Stems are, it's been mixed. You should be able to take however many stems you've got put them up at zero and that's really close to the thing it stems of. See, that's, that's you know? very interesting to me because you know, the stems that I think a lot of people sort of associate with stems is like the film mix days of like the stereo drums, the stereo instrument. Yeah. And sometimes I get stuff like that. And we were talking about the, the demixing like yeah. with, with the piano and the voice, I'll use that on drums. I can separate that into kick snare overheads and toms. Yeah, you have to be a total geek to do it, but you can yeah. do it. Yeah, that's way. So, I'll make stems for myself, and then there are lots of things you can do to spatialize. Blah 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 blah. But when you can hear it in a room, it's incredible. And um, I can even send you a link that you can share with your viewers. Okay. There's this guy Jules who I've met at a couple of like AES shows. He's fucking smart he builds his own microphones and he just built a 714 mixing setup for 2500 bucks a seven point seven one four so seven around head height four on the ceiling and a subwoofer okay all the amplification 2500 bucks all powered all amplification. So yeah. It's got all ampl so all you need is a monitor controller that can spit out eleven channels, well, twelve channels with a volume knob. But what, what, what does one of those go for? Well, you could do it with two Apollos. Mm. Mm. I'll send you the the link. It's yeah, on. Yeah, I'll put it up there. I'll put it up there. Uh, that's fascinating. Um, I do. You know, I only want to keep you for an hour, but. Um, well, it's been way over an hour because we started early, pal. Well, I mean, I, I'm chopping up a lot of your stuff. Like, well, that's fair. Enough. You don't want to. It's like I'm barely even going to talk. <laughs> I mean, it'd be like, and and it, but shoot, I'm like cutting you off like word, but you know. Perfect. There, there was somebody that did a reaction video to one of my videos, and like, he, I happened to see it, you know, because some people told me like, "Hey, this guy did a reaction video." I was like, "What?" So I hit play, and I'm like, the guy would literally. He would stop right there, like, 
and I would go like, and you know, and then I was thinking about like how hip hop, and he would stop. He's like, you know, he's really going a little deep on hip hop and really not for the, and then he would like play four more words. Wow. Like, all out of context kind of thing. We were like, okay. I've never watched That's awesome, movie. man. I mean, you know, getting a reaction video, it's, you've made it. Yeah, I've arrived. Yeah. Um, how does, uh, you know, how does someone hire you? I mean, you know, we want you to get hired, Andrew. Who do they reach? How do they reach you? I have a manager, okay, which makes yeah. it easy. Okay. Yeah. Frank McDonough. He's Frank based McDonough. in LA. He's awesome. I've been with him forever. Because I don't know about you, but I've found that like some people are like, they think, that you're a mythical creature and that they can't hire you. He's always too, uh, he's too busy. He's too busy. Well, I tell you what, I mean, look, yeah. I've been super lucky when I worked on that Adele record, every, there were people who like, Oh, I'm not even going to ask yeah. anymore. Yeah. First of all, it's just clear up the fact I did not get points on that record. I would have a much nicer shirt on. Oh, you wouldn't even take my call after. No, you know, Tony yeah. who, yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, yeah, you just, reach out to my manager and people reach out all the time. Lots and lots of indie artists see okay. forwards and tons of stuff okay. with very little budget. And sometimes the music's amazing yeah. and I do it. And sometimes I don't, you yeah. know, I've gone through it too, where like people reach out to me and say like, you know, I would know like if you're available to or would you mix or whatever? Like, yeah. You know, but they're like, Oh, I thought you'd be too busy to do this or that, or, you know, deal with my record or whatever. It's like, uh, no, and no, I mean, usually the decision, you know, it's this, uh, it's the the cheap, good and fast thing. But yeah. it's it the the real thing for me about taking gigs, and I'm sure it's the same for you. It's first of all, what is the budget? Because the money matters because it's going to take up a chunk of time and you need to eat. Of course, it's real. You know, yeah. food's good. Um, how much do you like the music? Because if you yeah. love the music, you probably would do it for free. And I've got plenty of records I've spent money on, totally. basically. Yeah, yeah, I've been there. Um, and how much of a pain in the ass are the people? If you smell a problem, which I, I'm sure you're like me, I'm really good at smelling a problem. I just won't do it. It's I mean, not usually I'm it. the smell. Well, I mean, yeah, either, either, yeah, you like, are the problem. Yeah, There's I am no the question. problem. I'm looking for the cure. But, but uh, well, the cure is cowbell, <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's yeah. like you can tell, like, they're going to be a pain in the ass. And then even if you love the music, it's probably not worth it. Yeah. You know, yeah. so that's the balancing act is those three things for me. I've always been, I mean, now looking back, it's always amazed me how like the, like getting a gig and not knowing what gig you didn't get because you were too busy with that one. And then that one ends and you wind up with a, that, that magical thing is enough to give anyone like an alka seltzer addiction because yeah you're, you're always wondering moved. like should i have taken that yeah. and it, because i took that i the studio hit factory went through that everyone was like you're the luckiest studio in the world you got the michael jackson session yeah and then it's unavailable for almost a year you lose all your clients yeah because there's only one uh yeah and i i went through that with like after the Michael thing and when I did a slew of hip hop stuff, then I wound up with like one producer for about three years. And then luck, like just as he was going over the, the, the falls, uh, I meet an Alicia Keys and like I go with her for five years. But during that, when you go like eight years with two, and I'm sure you yeah, experienced it. You disappear. You're like out of the loop. You know, yeah. some people are like, Oh, I didn't think you'd do anything else but her or whatever, or, you know, and then when yeah, you leave. Yeah. I mean, and so for that part of my career, it was really good that I was in LA. Yeah. But once I was at the point where like, okay, I could probably afford to eat with the way my career is going. At that point, it was way too unhealthy to be in the middle of the scene. It's just not good for me at all. Really? Yeah. Just uh, terrible. Every single gig I heard about that I didn't do would tear me up inside. Like, you, you know, you never struck me as somebody that was like, like, uh, that would get to you. I mean, dude, my imposter syndrome is insane. And I think I think part of it came from some of the gigs I did. You know, I don't think it started off as bad. I think like when we met, I think I there was 
I knew how ignorant I was, but I also knew that I knew a lot of weird shit that other people didn't know. And I was really good at integrating. Yep. Mm -hmm. Like that was my strength. Being the audio janitor mm -hmm. was a thing. Um, but yeah, I think some of the, the people I work with sort of undermine my own confidence about stuff because when you work with people who are really not demanding in a dickhead way, but demanding creatively even, you stop trusting your own instincts on stuff completely. Okay. Because it, it only matters what they think is good. Yeah. Yeah. And that for me was the slippery slope into like total imposter syndrome mode. Interesting. So I think that's probably what developed it. Because I don't remember having it before as much. Yeah. But yeah, no, it's terrible. It's really bad for me. And you're you're permanent in the UK. You're not. You're never coming back to like. You're, you live there full time. I, I'm on a freaking list. I can't come back. No, I can come back. Mm. So that's a, that's a a line from the very I end. I know a lot of, of those people. Joe Para. Um, but anyway, uh, who knows? I mean, our kids still live in California. Jake's up in Oakland. Sampy's in L.A. Okay. Um, my dad's still in New York. So that's been the great thing about AES is I always show up a few days yeah, early. I avoid you, AES because of that you coming back to AES. Yeah, which is fine, but you know, you wouldn't want to go anyway. The black shirt. Yeah. Black, the, the, do you put it in a ponytail for the AES just to blend in? <laughs> nope. No. Nope. Backpack, black backpack? Nope. No. Nope. No, this is some shit that I caught grief for for recently. I was like, yeah, I don't go to. I haven't been to AES in, since 1997. No, I go to see people. That's it. You know, yeah. I really do. It's just engineers. I, yeah, other people who do what we do. We're never in the room with other people who do what we do. Like you were saying, you know, yeah. we never hang out. Yeah. So, I mean, I probably saw 50 people that I hadn't seen since the last trade show, and Nam is exactly the same way. You going to Nam this year? Yeah. January? Yeah. Yeah. What's the name of the thing? The Bounce Factory? Bounce Factory. Yeah. Dot com or something like that? Uh, dot net. Okay. Send me that stuff, like, you know, so I could put, I'll put it the fancy shit across the bottom. I, look, I mean, Google Bounce Factory. There's not a lot out there. Well, actually, that's not true. It's all the Bouncy Castle people. Oh, that, that's funny. That's yeah, funny. there are a lot of companies called Bounce Factory. Okay. As it turns out. I think we'll we'll do this again at some point. You know, once you've no, we won't. come down off this no, high. No, we won't. No, we won't. You've come down off the no, high of being not. this close to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, man. I mean, we've had like three long conversations since that record. Three? Which is crazy. I think three, right? There was one before St. Louis at some point. Yeah, I when remember you were visiting. LA, you. You, were working at, you were working at Bay 7 and I came over to see you. I was working at Bay 7? You were working, or maybe you came to see me. I came to see you in L.A., and I don't remember exactly why I was, yeah, it was in L.A. Yeah, so it was Bay 7 out in the valley. You came to a studio, and we and hung Eddie out. Eddie was there, and he was working yeah. with that rock producer. Yeah. I don't remember. Worman? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I haven't seen Rob in, like, 25 years. No, I, I saw him, because obviously he came out to L.A. with the record. Um went to a wedding he was the groom he's been uh, several times yeah yeah well you know anyway i worked um, with heather a little bit for, uh, yeah in new york on a writing thing yeah i mean last time i saw him he's great you yeah, know okay. he's is he in the really music well. business yeah yeah as far as i know i mean he's certainly i mean it's been years since yeah. i've talked to him yeah but uh yeah he had a place downtown with a studio and was doing stuff and you know all the personalities were just unbelievable. Yeah, and Brian Vibbert's doing yeah. well, yeah. you know. The Vib. Carl yep. was the only person who was like, fuck this, I'm not working on this record anymore, and split. Yes. Which, good for him. Yes. He was really funny. He's like, man, this is not what I signed up for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was, it was, you know, and then we had the, the, the pilot, wherever he is nowadays. Yeah, Brad. I don't know. Somebody said that they that it, he was a pilot on a flight yeah. they took. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I heard that. Um, yeah, we'll do this yeah. again when when I, you know, trick you into coming online again. When you when you take some notes. Well, wait till you see like the things that are like I put across the bottom, like you know, not true, not true. Yeah, 
Yeah, you yeah. just have like a bullshitometer at the side that just fills up Filling immediately. Up. I think this is a this is a little different than your usual uh, podcast thing. Right? It's a hang. Look, yeah. it's when lockdown started, and you yeah. probably didn't see because you don't care about me at all. No. But I started doing. Um, uh, the guys from Pure Mix said when lockdown happened, he said we're going to start doing stuff every night, five yeah. days a week. Do really? you want to have a night? And I, okay, what am I going to do? Like, I don't know, do whatever the hell you want to do. Oh, I so I called it Andrew Talks to Awesome People because I had like 40 minutes to think of what I was going to call it right there. But I just did interviews with, you know, producers and engineers. And it started off where it's like, oh, it's an hour. But like what you were talking about, where you don't want it to be rehearsed or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I did, I mean, there are a couple interviews that were five and a half hours. Really? I did a three-part interview with Steve Lillywhite, which was insane. So Andrew talks to awesome people. When you got like 75 hours to kill, mm. have a listen. That's yeah, never going to happen. But uh, no, it's never I will happen. turn it on like whatever they, you know, a yeah. lot of the kids tell me that they like, they turn the shit on times two when I'm talking because it's not fast enough for them. Like, you know, well, you know what I mean? You know, fuck them. That's what I say. Exactly. Yeah. You have to slow it down to hear that. Exactly. <laughs> You know, like so oh, yeah, yeah we'll do this again you're, part two it's like you're you have so much you have so much to do that you can't listen to me talk for a half hour right you know like i know it's just you're so boring that's oh, all that, that means it's like you know i try don't <laughs> i try they, not to say the uhs too much or the but oh, do they slow it down when you're playing guitar or like i oh, fuck that i don't need to hear what he's actually they, doing. they should slow it down just to hear all the magic that's what i'm magic, saying magic happens you know yeah all right andrew like enjoy uh Whatever it is, you've probably got like the dinner coming up, right? Yeah, I'm gonna go have dinner. All I'm right, bud. Dinner. Thanks for doing Excellent. this. Thanks for having me. Uh, I got to figure out a slick title for this. You know, Andrew Sheps arrives. I, th I think I think if you just put my name in the title, your your viewership's gonna go crazy. It's gonna go <laughs> gonna wild. It. At least seven more people are gonna uh, watch your thing. <laughs> I got to pay for some bots just to make you look good. I mean, yeah. Just get for that. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, but yeah. By the time you're done with the video scrubbing, it's gonna be you'll lose money on this. Oh my god! I'll send you the stems. I'll tell you what you got to do though. Yeah. You got to get your camera out of autofocus mode because yeah. What's going on? Every I don't know. Every once yeah. in a while, it drifts, huh? Yeah. It's like I'm on a soap opera from like in the the 80s or something. Yeah. It's like it's Streisand. You know. I ha I do have. Hold on. I do have the. I could turn that off. That's oh. Oh shit! You look like that now. Yeah, I never would have done this. <laughs> I'm trying to like get the drift going. You know. No, now it's good because I can see the file cabinets better. I can see that you got a blue post-it note on the side. What's that post-it say? No, this is like a light. Oh, it's one of those things. One of those things. You know, you you're like. So it's a light basically Battery i was camera. excited that you had a post-it note and you were going to tell me what was on it i do but... have post-it notes see? and is that your yoga setup down next to your guitars i do have yoga i do do i do yoga um, i had yoga this morning we go to a class once a week once a week but you do yoga regular practice no i do other gym and swimming and stuff in between you know what i really like we're gonna we could be finished but just really quickly because i'm really into this now i've started doing the indoor uh rock climbing you know the rock climbing oh, really rock. it's really it's unbelievably hard but it's yeah. also thinky it's not like just going to the gym i get i started yeah. because i was like super overweight and it was not happening really yeah i would gained a lot of weight it was spread out all over the place but yeah but anyway, so this is like puzzle solving, but you're also working out. So anyway, sounds like a good plan. I mean, it is a good plan. Interesting. Yeah, we'll definitely do it again. I didn't even get to use all my little gadgets, like you know, switching cameras and stuff like that. Whatever. Uh, you want to switch cameras once? I like. I could do like I could pull you in full screen and then me full screen. I was gonna do that. Wow. But you know, that's next time. Okay, next time we'll get into gotta, all the hocus pocus. You got to keep them waiting. Maybe one of these days we would actually like drag up somebody like an Eddie for like a five minute thing or something like that. Yeah, that's it. And only five minutes. No, yeah. you got to shut up now. We're kicking you out. <laughs> all right. I'm going to hit the button. All right, man. All right, man.